Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome back to our agriculture podcast. We usually do our interviews on the road, and then we do the recording, editing, and remaining production back in Rick's studio when we get back home to San Diego. This week, we're doing the whole shebang on the road, so we're uploading our episode from a campground in Fort Benton, Montana, a historic town on the banks of the Missouri River. It's said to be one of the oldest settlements in the western United States. If you find Yellowstone National Park on a map and go straight north until you're about 100 miles from the Canadian border, that's where we are right now. We started in St. Paul, Minnesota on this trip where we picked up an RV for our 2,000 mile jaunt. We're glamping a bit compared to our usual mode of travel, and that means we have a bathroom and a shower, and I'm still not quite used to it. We hit my 49th and Rick's 50th state when we jumped across to Wisconsin. We took I-94 east and kept going through North Dakota, then headed into Montana and on up northwest toward Havre and Big Sandy, until almost the Canadian border. Needless to say, we've seen a bit of the northern section of the United States on this trip. Montana. If you've never been there, especially in the eastern and northern part of the state, it's hard to imagine the amount of wide open space. The sky is overwhelmingly vast, and the wind sings at you constantly. Cropland and grazing land go on for miles and miles, and you can see how people could go for days without even seeing their neighbor. The spaces are so huge up here. If Wikipedia is to be believed, in the state rankings, Montana is the fourth largest in area at about 147,000 square miles, but it's the eighth least populated. Last time we were in Montana was a more typical example of the normal climate, as it was really dry and sunny, but we managed to visit this time in the middle of a spate of storms that turned the sandy loam soil into something that looked more like gooey spackling paste once you put your boot in it. I can only imagine planting seeds in that, uh, especially when you're used to dry land farming methodology. That's what they do up here. Montana is a bit overwhelming, and living as a farmer here is not for the faint of heart. It takes a certain personality type to be able to live here successfully, and you would definitely have to be comfortable in your own skin or you might go screaming down the prairie one day. In all three of the farmers we had the opportunity to speak with, this pioneer spirit and steady fortitude was clearly evident. Our first two farmers are Doug and Anna. They hail from Velikas Farms in Havre, Montana. It's a 7,400 acre farming operation and they grow a great diversity of crops with a conservation-based ethic. If you look up Velikas, it's spelled V-I-L-I-C-U-S. There's a story about that word and you'll hear it soon. If you look up their farm, or the town of Havre, H-A-V-R-E, Montana, and if the map comes up with a place very close to the Canadian border, you've found the right place. We found out about Doug and Anna from Liz Carlisle, who's written a book entitled Lentil Underground. That's a whole other podcast, we hope, and hope to have that to you sometime soon. But until then, we're very thankful for Liz's introduction. This husband and wife team are extremely well educated, driven, and are champions of crop biodiversity and organic agriculture in Montana. They practice organic agriculture with a scientific methodology, but also deeply believe in the necessity for a greater long-term purpose in their farm stewardship. Anna's love of systems thinking and spreadsheets on the wall and the way into their kitchen warms my accounting soul. They've also launched an apprenticeship program for new farmers. We found that part of our discussion and the subsequent philosophical conversation really appealing and thought you might as well, so we've done something a little different this week. We usually try to keep our episodes to about half an hour, so this time we'll put out our regular podcast about what Doug and Anna are doing in their farm, and then we're putting out an extra half-hour podcast to tell you a little bit about their internship program and their worldview. Hopefully, it will give you a better glimpse into the minds of these intelligent and fascinating people. 
It was an incredibly wet, rainy, and cold day when we visited, and Doug and Anna could not have been more welcoming. They brought us into their delightful kitchen, introduced us to their three fox terriers, and we talked about all things farming and philosophy until past time to leave. Anna made fresh french fries and homemade hover beef hamburgers with arugula to send us on our way, and they were absolutely delicious. During our interview, you can probably hear the refrigerator in the background, the fireplace humming, the dogs meandering around, and the sounds of our glasses as they hit the butcher block countertop. Hopefully you feel like you were there with us. Here are Doug and Anna, stewards of the land. Yourself. All right. Hello, I'm Anna Jones Crabtree, Villegas Farms. Oh, you got to say that again <laughs> because that's the one word I had a hard time. Villegas. Villegas. Okay. Oh well, Villegas. It's Latin, so we don't really know how to say it. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll go for whatever you <laughs> we, decide. We had when they did the uh, audio book on Lindell Underground. I think we had like three different people call us and ask how to say the name. <laughs> well, you made something up and stayed consistent, yeah. right? Yes. Whatever that was. So we, we, have, we may not be accurate, but we're consistent. Yeah, this is true. So. And you? Doug Crabtree. Owner, operator, partner in Velikas Farms. Okay, and you both said it the same way. So. Yeah. Well, so tell me why you picked that name for your farm. Uh, I think that was my doing. I, um, I took four years of Latin in high school, and I didn't learn very much, but I did learn that there were um, two different words for farmer, and the one I really liked uh, meant, Velikas literally translated means steward of the land, and that became kind of an aspiration that when we had a farm someday, that's what we were going to call it, because that's what we wanted to be. Would you tell me your background? How you got to this place, your degrees, tell me, tell me about yourself. Mm. Well, I went to engineering school. I come from a long line of engineers. I went to Purdue, and I ended up finding a farmer <laughs> at Purdue. Um, and then Doug wasn't done with school yet, so I stuck around and got a master's degree. Oh, it was Doug that you found, so. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know. It was the farmer. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then it just took us till we became 40 to actually figure out how to make the farm happen. Well, it, you know, it, you said they're very casually an engineering degree. You have a couple of letters after your name, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, I have a, I have a PhD in engineering, civil and environmental engineering, with a specialty in sustainability. Uh, now, that's the first thing that you said that really most people would associate with some type of farming is the sustainability part. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the focus of my degree was more on, well, it was sustainable systems. So we're all about that. So my, my focus was more on facilities and buildings and energy systems and how do you create sustainability in our built environment. And those concepts, though, really apply to what do you do out here on a farm, on a land? What is your farming system? What context is your farm in? What's, your, what's the, the natural ecological processes around your farm? And how do you become part of those and not work against them? And how do you think about low inputs? Um, you know, don't want to import things from another place. How do you create your own energy if you're building? Same with a farm. How do you create your own energy and not send a lot of things away that you should be keeping to sustain yourself. So it was farming. Well and that was why I liked my engineering degree because my undergrad was construction management. So really how do you manage a large construction project? How do you put those pieces together? It's all about problem solving and thinking about that in a logical, kind of thoughtful, rigorous way. Do you functionally find that it's very much the same thing as the process of engineering design? Oh, you mean the, find the farming? Yes. Um, similar. I mean, that might be why we're well matched because Doug likes having a system for things and it's nice to know what the system is and how things work and then you can monitor over time and yeah. So Doug, tell me about you. You, you have quite a bit of experience in the farming end of things. Yeah, I mean, I come from a long line of farmers. 
I'm not really into genealogy, but as far back as anyone in my family knows, we were farmers. And I, I really believe that that is something you are, not something you do. Um, so it's what I are. And that never changed, even when there wasn't a farm to be managed. So, uh, you know, my family, where I grew up, we uh, went through the last so-called farm crisis, and at the end of that, no longer had a farm to return to. Uh, went to Purdue, where I met Anna, and uh, initially on an engineering scholarship, but uh, it didn't take me long to realize that was not my calling. Uh, one particular physics class in particular, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyhow, I, I got a degree in farm management and worked in that field and in research for a while. I went back and got a master's in plant science and that's when I really got into the organic thing. Is I, uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd done some farming even after we were married and uh, just was really frustrated at the, uh, basically the economics, that it was just not reasonable way to make a living and uh, the only answer that I came across was you know get bigger get bigger get bigger you got to get bigger and have economies of scale and yet if everyone's trying to do that uh, it's hard for anyone to so I, I kind of decided there had to be a better way and through some uh, off-site education, I guess you'd say, discovered this organic thing and then really got, you know, it really appealed to me. Uh, again, first and foremost from an economic standpoint. You know, if someone's willing to pay you two or three times as much for crops that it costs you half as much to grow, there's got to be something to that. And, it, you know, we've been at this long enough to know it's not nearly that simple, but at the, at the genesis, that, that's still what hooked us. And uh, so in my master's work, I did uh, about 100 interviews of practicing organic farmers really focused on their crop rotation because as a student, when I asked, you know, how do you do this? Because I'd grown up in farming and the answer was always, if you want to kill weeds, you go buy something to spray on them. If you want to uh, fertilize, you go have a truck bring you a product to provide that. And when I talk to these organic farmers, it's always, well, what do we do on the farm and with nature and with our system to provide the answers to our production challenges? And it's taken a long time to wrap my head around that. But um, the one thing that everybody said, and, and these were long-term practicing organic farmers, their first answer when I asked them anything was the crop rotation. That's how I manage weeds, that's how I manage pests, that's how I provide fertility. And so I did my whole master's uh, uh, research project on that and, and conducted these interviews. And um, that's really formed uh, sort of the basis of what became and is still evolving into our farming system. So it, uh, um, I you know, finished that and, and worked as an organic inspector and then managed a certification program for 11 years. But, you know, I don't think I ever had any aspiration to make a career of any of that. It was just a, until we could get a farm and get back to the calling. And then as 40 approached, at least I felt the urgency that if we're going to do this, we better get with it because we're not getting any Well, younger. it was great because we landed in Montana, so there was a really good core network of folks already doing organic in Montana, and so we got to learn a lot from them. And we actually spent probably like four years seriously looking at land and where to purchase and because after trying several land link programs, I mean, those just d did not work well for us. Um, so we decided we needed to buy our own and Montana seemed like a good place to land. We looked all the way up in Canada also because we were thinking about climate change. Northern and implications. Canada. Northern Canada. You're not so. far from Northern Canada now actually. Well, we're not far <laughs> from Canada now, but can Northern oh, Canada is way... The like, Peace River country, another 600 miles north, north from here. Yeah. 
Well, I, if you could, if you could just describe where you are. We're how many miles? Eight miles from the border? Yeah, we are in North Central Hill County. Uh, we're 37 miles northwest of Haver, our nearest town. Uh, we're eight miles from the Canadian border here at the headquarters. And some of our land is actually right on the border. We, um, if you look at a map of Alberta and Saskatchewan, where they meet, we're just right below that border. It, now, we, we've come on a fairly rainy day here, and it's a windy day. Is this your typical day? Not at all. No, we're, we're really happy to have the moisture because that in our dry land environment is really the, if there is a key, that's the one. Um, we're, we're in a moisture limited ecosystem. And, um, the last two years have been very dry, so we're really happy to, to be receiving some precipitation. Well, so you caught us kind of at a downtime. We <laughs> not done with seeding, but through the majority of seeding, and then to have it rain was just a real gift. It's lovely. So this is the moment we can actually catch you in the kitchen, in this yeah. beautiful kitchen oh. here. <laughs> yeah. in, a, in a relaxed pose. <laughs> Not out on the tractors. Yeah, it was rather wet here, and all the way in, I kept thinking, wow, this is quite different from the dry, arid thing that I'm used to seeing when we visited Montana previously. Mm -hmm. well, should have been here a day earlier. It was pretty dry. Lentils are very drought-tolerant, mm -hmm. arid, mm -hmm. forgiving plants, correct? That is one of their attributes. So, did you did you both say if we're going to have the area in Montana, let's grow lentils? How did that work? Well, I mean, part of this is like understanding the ecosystem that you're in. And so if you're going to do more sustainably minded, regenerative organic farming practices, you really you have to understand the ecosystem that your context is because every farm is its own individual. I mean, like every person is its own individual person. Every farm is their own individual farm. So you need to think about what works well in your ecosystem, um, what fits well with your crop rotation. Um, it's all interconnected yeah. that way. We, we don't think of ourselves as a wheat farm or a lentil farm or... Um, and we've struggled like what's the right terminology because it would be like, oh, you're a grain farm, but no, we seed 20 different things. Are we a specialty crop farm? And that connotes something different. Sorry. Yeah. So, you know, we have grown lentils, I think, every year we've farmed, but it's just one of many things. Uh, they have some pop popularity or notoriety because of the, the book we were honored to be part of. But, uh, um, yeah, we, we love lentils, to eat them, to grow them, but uh, they're just part of the story, really. Well, lentils are good, in my opinion, but you grow you grew the black beluga mm -hmm. style lentils. That's like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. When people haven't tasted those blue, do you call them beluga lentils? Belugas, lentils? Oh, yeah. Oh, they are delicious. Timeless has the <laughs> trademark. Trademarked, oh, yeah. They are, mm -hmm. uh, they are really tasty. Well, and there's a bazillion different kinds of lentils. This year we're growing red lentils. Um, four timeless again, which I think goes into the Patagonia provisions line, and so you know every lentil's a little different. There's a there's diversity in lentils, so there's diversity in your cropping systems yeah. as well. So we were, I, I have learned that we think about farming really differently from most, and so we started when we started this project. It was before we set plow to the ground. It was well, what are we going to grow? And, you know, the obvious answer in a county that I think 75 to 80 percent of the arable land is devoted to wheat, but I, I wanted to be a little more interesting or complicated than that. So having this background in uh, crop rotation as my focus, we, you know, I, I stepped back and I said, well, what can grow here? And what is being grown, what is grown in similar ecosystems around the world. And then, because I also have background as an economist, it was what can we sell? And uh, we, not 100%, but for the most part, we don't put anything in the ground until there's a contract and we know where it's going and under what terms and to whom. So we, we kind of put the agronomics and the economics together to determine what 
what we grow any given year and even in the, the long term. We rotate a five or seven year uh, program, but within each of those um, niches, if you will, there can be any any number of specific crops. So if it's a, a uh, light feeding grain, that might be emmer or spelt or uh, soft wheat or oats. And it just kind of depends on both the agronomics of what we know of the history of that field or strip and the economics of what the market will bear. Uh, sort of the art of putting a system together. Um, same thing with the, uh, we have a, a spring legume portion in the rotations. And so that can be, as we said, any number of colors or types of lentils. It might be green or yellow peas. It can be chickling vetch. It can be any number of uh, crops that have similar uh, characteristics that fit that niche in the in the rotation. Well, first I have to say, you, you had a background in economics and you decided to be a farmer. Isn't that kind of like saying I'll be a musician after that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I should be more specific. Uh, ag economics, which okay. maybe is a contradiction in terms of Yeah, but itself. what's some of that? You should have known what we're getting into. <laughs> Always the optimist. Okay. Well, I did, want to, I did want to mention, so you talked about the degree in plant science. Now that seems like in a little bit, not if not a contradiction in terms, somewhat related. I mean, it's a plant. You plant it. What is it? What what is the science to that in some ways? And yet, I know in my garden, it's not just you stick it in the dirt and it grows. And these days, we have a tendency to put the plant somewhere and then chemical it mm. in, into growing in a place it may or may not want it to go. And yet, you you are figuring ways around that to encourage it to do, uh, you know, with rotation, crop rotation, things like that, that that in your five or seven year uh, um, rotations, the plants actually take care of themselves in many ways. Do they not? Or take care of the soil? Could you describe that, if you would? Yeah. The, um, well, the farm itself we see as, as a functioning ecosystem, and the soil is part of that. And the, the plant and soil interaction is, you know, farming really we're stewards trying to, to manage and sometimes just get out of the way and let nature do what she does best. But uh, that is, well, it's complicated, but that's really the, the, the nuts and bolts of putting a, a crop rotation together is look, look at, you know, in what order and given that soil and its uh, needs and conditions, what fits. And we try to, uh, you know, there, there, there are a number of things we can grow and we, the market has an impact on what we choose to grow. And then once, once that, what can we do to, to enhance it as best we can? But it's a system. So, I mean, your soil, there's billions of microbes down there eating things. And if you're if all you're eating is monocrop wheat or corn or soy, I mean, how would you as a human feel if you ate the same thing every day? You wouldn't be very healthy, right? So what we're trying to do is just create an entire system, an entire healthy farm system. So thus the diversity of crops that, that provides diversity of food to our soil that provides diversity of food to humans. It provides a diversity of different crops that provide revenue streams off of the farm for us, a different set of buyers. So the complexity is is a little crazy sometimes, but I think nature's not, here's your checklist or your recipe. So we have to think a little differently about what our role in in supporting that diversity and that, that whole system that functions together. So one of the other things we do, um, and it all comes back to diversity, and, and we've decided that part of our strategy is to enhance diversity whenever and wherever we can within this um, ecosystem we're managing. So in addition to the rotation where we have a different crop on a given strip every, every year, we're doing other things. One of them is in the 
layout of our farm, which is easier to see than to explain, but um, we have extensive field borders and then in between every strip of crops we have what we call conservation strips that are 20 to 30 feet wide where we seed them intentionally to a mix of perennial species and those serve as a, um, a reservoir if you will for beneficial organisms and for wildlife corridors and for um, not not the least of which the pollinator species to have their habitat. And between those borders and the, the strips, we have uh, I think 26 percent of our tillable land is devoted to conservation. And we believe, uh, don't have data yet to fully document it, but we believe that we're able to grow as much or more on the 74 percent as we would if we tried to farm every acre in annual crops Straight yield. You're because we get the benefits of this diversity. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we don't fully comprehend yet about the interactions of all these natural systems and the components of the natural systems and how they work together. And so what we're trying to do here on, on this farm is really be a laboratory, be a model for how could we think about doing this differently than, than what's been done in the past and give space for some of those interactions because it's really more about a relationship. Like if you give an opportunity for nature to do what she's going to do and observe, there's a lot that you can learn and, and it won't be, um, it's more about a collaboration than any competition. So I think that's another driving factor for us is it's diversity, but it's also about collaboration. Where does that show up. But it, it sounds a little touchy-feely to me on the surface, mm -hmm. but, but you know when you're describing your 70, what is it, 74 percent you said it is what you're... Um, is what we're cropping. Is what you're cropping? On average, yes. So if you fertilize 75 percent less, 74 percent, but not the other 26, and you, you have less work because you basically cut the amount of work that you have, by a quarter, correct? I mean, you're not going to plow that. You're not going to. I guess you're planting seed and you're purchasing the seed, but in some ways, your inputs have gone down, and so does it cost less as well? Well, we kind of solved that problem from the start because we don't. Really, the one exception being some of the seeds and um, legume inoculants, we don't buy any inputs. You know, this farm is striving towards being a self-contained organism. And so we, we don't look to external solutions. So on, on one hand, you know, that, that's our, our goal and our mantra, but it's also, it doesn't help us to be more efficient because we're not using anything to begin with. So um, there's not a lot to say well, when you're not some, buying it. In, in the some first regards, place. we're probably looked at as more like crazy and complex because of the way our field layouts are. And I mean, you're not doing a giant block, 320 acres of lentils at a time. You're doing 25 to 50 acres of lentils at a time, and then you're moving five strips down or seven strips down to do another strip of lentils. So, you know, I think we're trying to, in some way, model diversity both spatially and then temporally as well and really play with that more around how, how do we do that and it takes more people to do that and takes more equipment because you have different things that you're doing with the soil. Uh, so another way that we're enhancing and building in more diversity into the system is we are intercropping the majority of our acres. Um, one example of that is uh, on our lentils, which are not by themselves a very competitive crop, and there's space, uh, sunshine, space, soil open to uh, light, and when you leave that, nature tends to fill the space, and uh, what she chooses as the first successional filler is not always what we want to have. But what we're learning is if we put something there that will fill that niche, then we can have a situation where one plus one may equal more than two, where by coming up with the right combination, the total yield will be more than either if grown independently. 
And in the case of uh, lentils and flax, we're, we're pretty optimistic that that's going to be a good combination. Uh, we're also looking at, um, as I said, the majority of our crops, we're intercropping at least one other species to, um, you know, it's, it's just to give a better diversity, mostly for the soil ecosystem, that if you provide um, uh, a more complex diet, if you will, for the biology in the soil, then that will build a healthier community, which in turn then makes a, a better environment to grow things above the soil. So we're, it's very much an experiment and what science there is there is not very well developed, but, but we've just decided, I think our phrase this year was to double down on diversity. So not only are we growing 20 crops, but we're, we're growing at least two on almost every acre. We're doing cover crop cocktails and for some of our uh, uh, green manures where we're growing nine species um, seeded simultaneously and growing together. And um, Well, that's all been kind of an evolution for us because the, you know, the premise of a crop rotation is you, you have a rotation because that helps you with pest management, it helps you with weed management, it helps you with disease management because you're not growing the same thing year after year after year. So there's a different species with a different root system with a different above ground biomass and that all works to not give a place where pests can hang out and build houses. So, so for us to say, okay, now we're going to start intercropping or we're going to use these cover crops that are multi-species, you may end up where you have the same species or a similar species crop year after year, but it's within this uh, portfolio of diversity. So we're anxious to see how that happens because there are some potential diseases that get carried in the soil around lentils, for example, ascotida can be a really bad deal. Like if we get ascotida, we won't be growing lentils on this farm, which is a key revenue stream for us and a key part of our crop rotation. So um, thinking about the diversity, we're trying to evolve our system into more, um, more diversity, but we're also thinking the science that we, as we know it now, is not necessarily um, caught up to what does it look like for having systems that are that diverse? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's been a real area of, of research and, and experimentation because, you know, the conventional wisdom, if, if you ask a, a plant scientist from Montana State, you know, you grow lentils in the rotation, you want to have at least three years between any uh, lentil crop or any even similar crop to avoid this buildup of disease, but yet if you talk to other scientists in their tower about um, uh, diverse species and cocktail mixes, no one has ever had a problem with development of disease when you're narrowing that interval. So I don't understand all the science yet, but what what we're trying to put into action is just create a, a community where diversity is a strength. and. You know, we, we would not, still not plant lentils every year or even every other year, but there are other... Legumes that would be in the... Other pulse crops or, or green manure crops that fix nitrogen that you can grow, uh, different clovers, and we're, I think this year we're going to try something called guar. Uh, always wanted to have a warm season legume, and those are not generally grown here. So we're looking at, well, what are species that can thrive in hot and dry circumstances and still have a, that um, leguminous relationship with soil bacteria to leave nitrogen behind? And so, you know, that's another dart we're going to throw at the wall, if you will, is try to add to our collection of opportunities to... So you're not only balancing the chemistry, i.e. nitrogen fixers are great, you know, legumes, alfalfa is actually a fixer too, but mm -hmm. it's all over the place. You're balancing the excess nitrogen that you might have that might, well, I guess, maybe not run off here <laughs> if water's not a problem, but excess nitrogen. You're balancing the bacterial and fungal mix in the soil and the pollinators. 
is this a really delicate balance? Do you get to the point where you're saying we're changing too many things, or do you want it to constantly change and try and catch up? Mm. I think the shortest answer is we don't know. Um, but our default has become, if in doubt, let's diversify. You know, if um, if we if we think there's a equal chance of something we've been doing working and something new, we're probably going to try the new thing. And if it's uh, uh, two crops work good and and we think three might, we'll probably go to three. Um, um, I have to remind myself of that when I'm in the complexity of <laughs> bringing all the seed and changing and cleaning out and making the mechanics of it work. But uh, we really are committed to this and we believe that um, when we look to nature as our model, which is one of our foundational principles, that there is no monoculture in nature. And the deeper you look, the more diversity you find, both above and below the soil surface. And so we're trying to emulate that in our system. So offhand, both of you, if you could just name some of your 25 different crops that you had, just name the names of them in a list. <laughs> Spelt. Emmer. Rye. Soft white wheat. <laughs> Naked oats. Hollis, also known as Hollis. Hard red spring or winter wheat. Oh, are we still on the grains? Yeah, we haven't even got beyond grains. I'm trying yet. to think. Ah, uh, you did red. You did hard red winter, right? Two for the price of one. And you did soft. We've done kamut. Not we this did, year. We did. Um, uh, Durham. Uh, We've done Durham. What was the Sonora white wheat we oh. grew? Um, black malugas. Lentils. Crimson lentils. Oh shoot! What are the red ones this year? Well, they're, they're the not varieties crimsons. are um, uh -oh. red berry, red berry, red cliff, lairds, big fat <laughs> lairds. Those are green. They were fun to grow. Um, green and yellow peas, dry peas, <laughs> chickling vetch. Um, get into the cocktails. We're doing uh, burseem and medium red and sweet clover. Yellow blossom, sweet clover. Flax. Buckwheat. We've done safflower. We did sunflowers one year. That was fun. Two. Oh, two. And Paul planted sunflowers. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Maximilians. I guess we haven't even done the pollinator strip. We can talk about all the natives <laughs> in the pollinator strips. <laughs> If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. We want to thank Doug and Anna for feeding us today. <laughs> I mean, for having us today out at their farm. And for more information, please visit their website at velikasfarms.com. If you would like more information on Liz Carlisle's book, Lentil Underground, it's available for download or purchase, and we got ours at Amazon.com. Thanks again for joining us. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. We'd also like to thank our producer, Michelle Council. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.